Okay, in chapter three, we're going to talk a little bit about independent assortment and the inheritance of multiple genes. Um, the last chapter, we talked about inheritance of a single gene that had a couple different traits. Uh, that is called a monohybrid cross. We did the Punnett square for it. This chapter, we're going to do two of these genes. Okay, once again, here's the chapter outline. This is for your reference when you go back and study. Continuing on with uh, our favorite example for uh, these Punnett squares, we're going to keep using Mendel and his pea plants. Uh, in this picture here, we have a uh, pea pod that is opened up and inside uh, the colors are a little distorted on my screen. I don't know if they are in, in your textbook or on your slides, but uh, there are two different uh, genes that are controlling two different traits, right? So we have uh, yellow peas, um, which I believe would be like this. And we have green peas, which I believe would be these over here. And then we have uh, solid or, or smooth, I should say, uh, peas. And we have wrinkled peas. So those are the two traits that we'll focus on in this first example. So this is a dihybrid cross. Uh, here we have two different individuals that each have two different traits. Uh, so the plant on the left is a plant that is homozygous dominant for the round genotype. It's got the big R, the big R, and it's recessive for the color uh, phenotype. So it's small y, small y. So it is a round green pea plant. Now what it's being crossed with is a plant that is recessive. So small r, small r for the smooth phenotype and thus it is wrinkled. And it is homozygous dominant, big Y, big Y, for the color or the, the pigmentation of the pea plant and thus it is yellow. So we're adding another little wrinkle to our, our cross here um, and we're showing what the gametes or the uh, haploid that the offspring um, or sh I should say the sex cells of this plant are. So the pollen or the ovule that would be in the plant that gets pollinated, um, they're going to have one copy of the uh, dominant uh, shape gene in the case of the green pea plant, um, and they're going to have one copy of the recessive um, color gene in this pea plant. And that's because those are the only genes possible when these gametes are created, right? So this gamete, which will only have half of the parent's genome, has to have a big R because that's all that the parent has, and it has to have a big Y. Similarly, with the yellow plant, it has to have a gamete that has a small r because that's all it can get. All of its, its parent was homozygous uh, for the wrinkles gene. And it also has to have a big Y because its parent, uh, that's the only gene that it can pass down. So now when these gametes combine, we get the F1 generation, right? That's the first filial generation. In this generation, we have plants that are Home, or heterozygous, excuse me, heterozygous for both of these two genes, right? So we have the big R that came from the green pea plant and a small r that came from the yellow pea plant and then a big Y that came from the yellow pea plant and a big, a small y that came from the green uh, pea plant. So we call this heterozygous when it has not two of the same but two different alleles at each gene. Now, similar to the monohybrid cross that we did in chapter two, uh, the first filial generation, if you self them, you get offspring. You get a lot of offspring in a pea plant, obviously a lot of pea pods on the plant, a lot of peas within those pea pods. And if we count the individuals that are produced from one pea plant, we get this ratio that ends up roughly in a nine to three, to three to one ratio. Remember uh, last chapter, if we had um, this uh, uh, selfing of a heterozygote, we got a three to one ratio. Well, now if we combine two genes and we look at the segregation of those genes, we get this nine to three to three to one ratio. Now these are ratios that are gonna be important for you to remember. We're gonna get uh, quite a few of them uh, as we get into some of these uh, weird cases of inheritance, um, but in general, we have the three to one, which is a uh, monohybrid cross, and we have the nine to three to three to one, 
which is this dihybrid cross. In the textbook, and this slide here is just showing you exactly what, uh, what I just pointed out, that this ratio is a 93 to 3 to 1 ratio. So now let's set up this same cross, but instead we're going to do it with a Punnett square to explain how we get this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. So we start with the same two parents. We have a homozygous dominant uh, for shape uh, and a homozygous recessive for color. So that's our round green pea plant. Uh, and we're going to cross that with a homozygous recessive for shape and a homozygous dominant for color. And that's a wrinkled, wrinkled yellow pea plant. Again, we show the gametes that are possible from these two individuals. And for the uh, round green pea plant, we can only have a uh, dominant R and a recessive Y. And the opposite is true for the yellow wrinkled pea plant, where we can only have a recessive uh, R and a dominant Y. When these gametes combine uh, to form the first filial generation, the F1 generation, remember we have heterozygotes at each of those genes. So it has one copy of the dominant allele and one copy of the recessive allele for round, so big R, small r, and one copy of the uh, dominant allele for color, big Y, um, and one copy of the recessive allele for uh, color, small y, um, so thus it's big Y, small y. Okay, so here's where we get into the weeds a little bit about it. So when we set up this Punnett square, we're, it's going to be much bigger than the monohybrid cross, right? Because we're looking at two traits. So if you think of this as our Punnett square last time was four boxes, right? And we're doing two of those, two genes that would usually have the single Punnett square, but we're looking at them together. So we multiply that together, right? A four box Punnett square times a four box Punnett square equals a 16 box Punnett square. And that's what we have here. So when we set this up along the top axis, it, because we can do reciprocal crosses here with these pea plants, the sex doesn't really matter. Um, and since they are identical, we're selfing the F1 generation. Uh, it's going to be identical on both sides, uh, both axes of this Punnett square. So um, we start with our shape, a homozygous dominant R, and we can either get that uh, have an individual that also receives a homozygous dominant color or receives a recessive color, right? So there's only four possibilities of how the gametes of this F1 generation would self as. So one would be big R, big Y. One would be big R, little y. Another would be little R, little y, or little R, big Y. Those are the only four possible combinations of a gamete from this first generation. On the second axis, we have the exact same thing. Because this is a selfing of this first filial generation up here, we're going to have offspring that have the same gametes on both, right? So again, we can have a gamete that has homozygous dominant for R and homozygous dominant for Y. One that is, excuse me, not homozygous dominant, is just dominant for R and dominant for Y. We have an offspring or a gamete that is dominant for R, but recessive for Y. A gamete that is recessive for Y and for R. And a gamete that is recessive for R, but dominant for Y. So remember, those are the only four possible combinations that these gametes can have. And you also have to remember, gametes only have half of their parents' um, genetic information, because if you double your genetic information every time you had offspring, then you know, after 50 generations, there would be, you know, a thousand chromosomes inside you and, and it's not productive. So these gametes only provide half the information from their parents. So now we start filling in the combinations up and down the columns and adding together the R's and the Y's and then fill in, filling in each square. So we start with the top left here and we have, because the uh, female has a dominant R and a dominant Y, and the male on the top here has a dominant R and a dominant Y. We have homozygous dominant R and homozygous dominant Y for that square. We move over to the next square and we look, and we have, again, a dominant R and a dominant Y. So we add a dominant R and a dominant Y. And then on the male side, we have a dominant R and a recessive Y. So we add that dominant R and that dominant 
or that recessive y. We move to the third square here. We have dominant r, dominant, uh, dominant y again. And then for the male, we have recessive r, recessive y. And for the last square here, we have dominant r, dom dominant y, recessive r, recessive y. So now we continue by filling in the rest of the Punnett square here. I'm not going to go through individually every square of the column to fill them all in. Um, but once we're done with this square, um, what is nice with this textbook example is that on top of the genotype, which is the exact copies of the alleles that we see, so this would, the genotype for this would be dominant R, dominant R, dominant Y, dominant Y, we also have the phenotype in a picture. So the phenotype, remember, this is the physical trait that you can see as opposed to what genes it has. Um, so the phenotype for dominant R, dominant R, dominant Y, dominant Y is the same as the phenotype for homozygous dominant R, heterozygous for Y, right? Because whenever you have a dominant allele and a recessive allele, the dominant allele is going to show its phenotype. That's why it's dominant, right? So it, it dominates over that recessive phenotype. So you can actually see the dominant allele and not the phenotype of the recessive allele. So what we're going to do now is we are going to count up all of the phenotypes that we see. So if we count up the number of round yellow pea plants in this Punnett square, down here at the bottom it shows we have nine of them, right? So we have four here, three here, one, and one. I apologize for my circling. I'm trying to do this with a mouse and so some of my, I hope it's a little bit legible for you. Um, so now if we look at the round green phenotypes, we have this center portion right in the middle there. And then if we look at the uh, green wrinkled, I'm gonna try to change the color here. Uh, we have, or sorry, yellow wrinkled, the bottom corner there. And then lastly, uh, for the wrinkled green, the one out of the nine to three to three to one, we have just a single um, uh, individual there in this ratio. You feel utterly lost about what we're doing with Punnett squares. Don't worry, there will be um, ample time to practice and we're gonna do examples in the class. Uh, so moving on, we're gonna talk a little bit about hybrids. Um, hybrids are this very interesting concept, also known as heterosis. Um, and in a lot of plants, um, you see this really amazing uh, phenotype that, or phenomena, I should say, that happens called hybrid vigor. Um, so this is an example in corn, uh, where on the left and the right sides here, um, let me get my, there we go, left and the right, we have two parents of genetically homogenous or, or very uniform genetic um, composition. So kind of like our pea plants that we started with before, they have two copies of all the same alleles. Think of it that way. Um, and when you cross these two, in the middle here you have an example of their offspring, and this is a hybrid. So it's a mixture of two different cultivars. It could be two different cultivars, um, two different breeds, two different species. These would all be considered hybrids. Um, but this hybrid shows what is called hybrid vigor in it. So these plants have much higher or bigger uh, accumulation of biomass. They're generally healthier. Um, now, if you are out in Kansas or Iowa or the Corn Belt, Nebraska, and you drive by a field, it will usually say, um, you know, K1 hybrid or Monsanto hybrid or Syngenta hybrid um, because these corns just bring bigger yields. And so farmers use these a lot um, because of this, this interesting phenomenon where the offspring are generally bigger when you mix two pools of genes. So again, if we uh, were to go to the supermarket or to the you know, neighborhood market or you know, super saver foods, uh, you could go down the aisle of, of corn and generally now all you see is this hybrid corn. So you see these big you know, corn cobs, but the parents of these individuals don't produce nearly as big of corn cobs uh, as their uh, offspring do. 
I may be dating myself a little bit here, but um, if any of you have seen Napoleon Dynamite, there's a famous part where he talks about being a liger or liking ligers. Uh, and a liger is actually a real animal. It is a hybrid cross of a lion and a tiger. So this here is an example of a liger. You can just see how giant a liger is. Um, and there's also, I, I can't remember which is which, but depending on who the female is and who the male is, you have a liger and you also have a tigon. Um, but there are also more, um, I guess, relevant or, or common examples of hybrids. Uh, for example, you may um, have had experience or, or seen a mule. Uh, a mule is just a hybrid between a donkey and a horse. Um, and so generally in, in mammals, uh, these hybrids aren't able to reproduce themselves. And um, I'm going to post a video uh, on Canvas for you to look at is, and, and see why that is. It's a very good uh, animated video as to why mules generally, there's always weird exceptions in biology, but they generally aren't able to reproduce. So as the title of the chapter suggests, the reason that we see these ratios the way they are is because of independent assortment. And so independent assortment is the idea that when these chromosomes go to line up in the cell and be divided during meiosis, uh, there's no tie between any those two genes. So if A were to move to one cell, so in this case, uh, the dominant A is on this kind of orange or golden colored chromosome, whatever cell A gets segregated into through the process of meiosis has no effect on any of these other chromosomes where they go, right? So after this first prophase, we have anaphase. And in this case, it leads to a telophase where the dominant A chromosome and the dominant B chromosome are segregated to one of the two uh, daughter cells. But in another case, it can be the dominant A and the recessive B that are segregated to those two. And then through further splitting, we have combinations of big A, big B, big A, big B, little A, little B, little A, little B. And in another case, we have big A, little B, big A, little B, little A, big B, little A, big B. So which cells the chromosomes or the genes for these, chrom um, these traits end up in have no impact on one another. Now, if the gene for, uh, say, P, the color of the pea plant, the green and the yellow, were on the same chromosome, so say here we had A and B on the same chromosome, we would no longer have independent assortment. And in that case, we have what's called linkage. And so we're going to get to linkage in a little bit in a, in a couple of chapters here. Um, but for all of these examples from Mendelian inheritance, it assumes independent assortment, meaning that each gene and each trait we're looking at is on its own independent chromosome. So here we just have kind of a cheat sheet of that last uh, uh, photo that we saw. Uh, we start with um, a uh, gamete of dominant A, dominant B, and uh, little a, little b, and we get this first filial generation where they're both heterozygous both genes, big A, little a, big B, little b. And then through the process of meiosis, their gametes can have one of these four different outputs. It can either have a big A, big B, a uh, little a, little b, so homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or two that are heterozygous. So now here we're going to look at the phenotypes uh, of the individuals from this cross and we're going to see how many of them match the parental generation. So when we look at uh, the gametes from the two parents in this cross, in a, a dihybrid cross where we have one parent that is uh, homozygous for both the dominant alleles and one that is homozygous for both the recessive alleles, we have gametes, so pollen in this case, um, when we talk about Mendel's plants, um, that are have one copy of the dominant A allele, one copy of the dominant B allele. And for the other uh, parent, we have um, a copy of the recessive A and a copy of the recessive B. Looking at the F1 generation um, of this cross, we have 
uh, individuals that are all heterozygous for uh, both of these genes. So they each have a copy of the dominant A and the recessive A and the dominant B and recessive B. So now what we're gonna do is what's called a test cross or a tester. Um, what this does is this exposes the phenotypes, so the visual traits um, of the offspring or the, the uh, yeah, offspring of this uh, F1 first filial generation. And so a tester is always homozygous recessive for every allele. And so we have little a, little a, little b, little b. So we have the F1 generation, and we cross that with this tester, homozygous recessive for every allele, and we get four possible offspring. And so because this tester is completely um, homozygous recessive, you're going to have little a, little b in every offspring. And so we're just going to ignore these for now, right? We're going to cross out all the bottom copies of this little a, little b, and we're going to look at the other two chromosomes. And so if we look here, we have a big A, big B, and because the tester only contributes recessive genes, the phenotype of this would be show the phenotype of the big A and the big B. And that is the same phenotype we see in this parent. In the second offspring here, we have a completely recessive set of genes that would be exposed or what you would see the phenotype for because there's no dominant gene to preside over it. So that is also one of the parents that we had crossed in. But now we look at this third and we see that we have a dominant A. So we would see the phenotype for that dominant A, but we have a recessive B. So this it, we would call a recombinant because none of the, it's got half of what one parent had. So half of the parent up here and half of this parent here. And then lastly, we have this final uh, individual who has a recessive A and a dominant B. And again, neither of these parents up here have that combination of genes. So this would be considered a recombinant as well. We can label these as parental type if they show the phenotype of one parent. Uh, so the top two where the dominant A and the dominant B um, are shown is remember parent one, uh, the second individual parent two, and then these last two would be recombinants. Unfortunately, most of genetics isn't as simple as a simple dominant and recessive uh, phenotype for each of these traits. So uh, you don't have people that are just blonde hair or brown hair, you have a continuum of that. Um, another good example is height, um, and usually these um, phenotypes show this continuous variation in, in populations. And so in this example here, um, I'm sure you know somebody in your life who is um, an adult and they are, you know, barely five foot. I have a couple of them. My mom is very short. Um, and the majority of people you know, um, if you're a male, uh, probably right around 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 um, if you're female, probably around 5'4", uh, 5'5". Five, five, five. Um, but then you know, you know, the Louisiana Tech basketball players or uh, the guys you watch in the NBA who are, you know, 6'11", 7 foot, Yao Ming, uh, played basketball. He was like 7'7", seven, seven, I think, 7'5", seven, 7'7". Five, seven, seven. Um, so some very um, big people there, and that's because there's multiple genes that are contributing. And so uh, for the people on the low side here, they got a lot of alleles for these genes that um, contributed to short help, uh, stature. Um, for the NBA players and the very tall, um, they got a lot of genes that cont contributed to uh, the, the large height, and then most of us, through random chance, would get some sort of mixture of those genes, where we end up kind of this medium height. Uh, for me, I am uh, 5'10", 5'11", uh, so I'm right in the middle of that bell-shaped curve. Okay, so now we're going to look at that same dihybrid cross we looked at earlier that gave us that three to three to or nine to three to three to one ratio, and we're going to assume that those two genes, instead of giving us two different phenotypes like round and wrinkled and green and yellow coloration, 
they are instead going to both contribute to the same phenotype. And so this is what we call dosage. And so if we self the heterozygous, so this would be that uh, F1 generation that we saw earlier, if we self that individual, then we have three possible outcomes for each individual, or for each selfing. And so you could get either the big R for both of those genes, you could get a big R and a small R, or you could get two of the small Rs, right? Those are our only combinations that we can get. So if we do this for both parents, then it's possible that you get two big R's from your father and you get two big R's from your mother. You get two uh, doses of the big R from your mother and only one from your father. You get zero doses from your father but you still get the two doses from your mother. And we're going to continue on and fill out this entire um, uh, Punnett square here to see the odds of getting a certain number of doses. So if you have two uh, heterozygous uh, individuals that f uh, cross to produce offspring, then you have a 1 in 16 chance to get all four dominant copies of that allele. You also have a 1 in 16 chance to get zero doses of that allele, um, but you're most likely to fall somewhere in the middle. So if we plot this out, up, uh, before we plot this out, uh, so here is a, a overview of the uh, possible progeny for um, from this Punnett square. But if we were to plot this out as a histogram, we see that down at the bottom, we've plotted the number of doses and the frequency of those doses along this x-axis here. And we see that you're most likely to have a medium number of doses. You're most likely to have two doses. You're least likely to have zero or four doses, um, but more likely to fall in between the extremes. Now, if we were to take this idea and we were to expand it beyond a dihybrid cross to a trihybrid, where instead of having just the two traits like round and wrinkled and green and yellow, we expand it to three, but they all control for the same trait, then our histogram expands where we have a lot higher probability of having three. The most we could have is six copies of the dose, right? So we'll, if we have three genes, that all have big R, small R, the most you can inherit is six copies of that gene. The least you could inherit would be zero copies of that gene. And so the more genes you have, the more rounded out and large this uh, histogram gets, and the probability of you ending on the extremes gets smaller and smaller. So we've talked a lot about uh, the inheritance of genes, dihybrid cross, trihybrid cross, uh, gene dosage, but one thing that we fail to talk about is organelles and how organelles inheritance patterns are different. Um, that is because most of these genes that we talk about, the large amount of your chromosomal uh, DNA is found in your nuclear DNA, so it's in the nucleus on your 23 chromosomes. Um, however, you have little chromosomes in you um, that are mitochondrial DNA, so your little mitochondrion, little powerhouse of the cell. Um, those are formerly organisms that lived on their own and were kind of uh, formed a symbiotic relationship with eukaryotes, um, and they have their own DNA, and their inheritance pattern is not the same as nuclear DNA. Uh, this is also similar for uh, chloroplasts and plants, um, the, you know, photosynthetic uh, powerhouse of those cells. Uh, they also have their own DNA and the inheritance patterns for both of those um, uh, two organelles is different. So here we see a couple of the different organelle genomes. So uh, these organelles have circular uh, genomes that are very, very small in comparison to um, the nuclear chromosomes. We see that yeast is about, uh, is a little bit bigger than human. Um, with about 78 kilobases. Uh, human DNA is very small, uh, 17 kilobases, and then chloroplast, in this case liverwort chloroplast, is bigger than both of them at 121 kilobases. But these, compared to the rest of your uh, genome, are very, very small. 
So one interesting phenotype that arises from uh, these chloroplasts, uh, chloroplast genomes is this variegated uh, leaves from in plants. And what this is, is plants that have um, both chlorophyll filled cells and then albino cells that don't have any uh, chlorophyll. So what's interesting with chlorophyll inheritance or genes, gene inheritance from uh, chlorophyll uh, DNA is that chlorophyll is only passed down via the mother. And it's the same thing with um, mitochondrial. And if you think about uh, development with uh, egg and sperm for humans, uh, the sperm is very, very small compared to the egg. So the sperm really has DNA and nothing else in it, just a few enzymes to help fertilize the egg. All the rest of the packaging of, of what needs to start for life, the cell, the mitochondria, etc., are in the egg. So the mom's passing that down. So if we look in this example, we have uh, two plant cells. One has albino uh, chloroplast and one has green chloroplast. And when they reproduce, the mom contributes 100%. And so the offspring of the white chloroplast is an a individual that has white chloroplast. <laughs> and the offspring of a mother that had green chloroplast is an inv individual that has green chloroplast. So let's look at reproduction of these variegated individuals. And so it's possible that the gamete of a female variegated individual will be only white chloroplast, and this is because of random chance of the segregation of those chloroplasts in the egg. You could have only green due to random chance, or you could have an individual that is like their mother that is variegated itself and has both green and white chloroplast. When those eggs get fertilized, they'll have the same phenotypes as their mother. So they'll have white chloroplast if they had this white egg, they'll have green chloroplast if they had a green egg, or they'll have variegated if they had a variegated egg. Now, during random cell division, when this cell here divides, the chloroplasts are randomly divided into the daughter cell. So it's possible that the cell will produce, will have an offspring or a daughter cell that is only green or only white. So let's look at how this fixation and this drift can happen. Um, and so we start with an individual that is like our variegated individual where we have 100 or a, a mixture, 50-50 mixture of two different uh, organelle genomes. So we had the white and the green chloroplasts. After cell division, you're dividing these randomly between the two daughter cells, right? So uh, they just split 50-50. Eventually, similar akin to uh, genetic drift, you can get to a point where through random chance, after you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these cell divisions, you randomly divided all of the same organelle into one or the other daughter cell. So you see here in these daughter cells, we're getting, okay, there's a lot more pink than purple, or we're getting to have more pink than purple, and then this daughter cell, we're getting to have more purple uh, than pink. Um, but through random chance here, these daughter cells divided equally, where the pink went into one daughter cell, and the purple went into this other daughter cell. What happens then is that from now on, these cells have to be pink. They can no longer produce purple offspring, or they it can only produce pink offspring, no more variegated, so they're fixed. They, they've drifted to this fixation point. On the other hand, uh, these daughter cells down here on the right, they're still variegated, and they can continue to be variegated in perpetuity. It's all based on random chance. So lastly here, I just want to hit on this mitochondrial genome one more time. Um, I know a lot of you are med school. Um, hopefuls or you're going to go into some sort of health perfection. Um, and there are a lot of genes on this mitochondrial uh, chromosome that play a role in human disease. And so here's just a list of some of the diseases that occur, um, common ones like deafness and anemia, um, and to more rare diseases as well. Um, but this is just for your, for your information and knowledge. And uh, so respect the mitochondrial uh, mitochondrial genome. 
Uh, that does it for chapter three. Um, if you have questions, send me an email and we'll talk about this uh, during discussion.